Thank you. So uh, I am Victor Kuman. Um, I um, am from a PhD student from Kaiser Leuven, and I work at Dristinet. And together with my colleagues, I hacked a doorbell. In this talk, I will talk about the vulnerabilities we found in the proprietary protocols we encountered. So first of all, who is UAP? Well, basically, UAP is a company that was founded in 2016, and it's already among the market leaders. It's a fast-growing company, and they focus on security. On their website, they proudly say, we uh, implement military-grade encryption. Interesting. Um, a a UAP device is present in around one out of 334 uh, households, so it's a widespread brand. Um, they have doorbells and home bases. A home base is like a, a hub every device of it connects to. They have indoor cameras, they have vacuums, they have everything. So um, how did we end up um, analyzing an OAV device? Well, basically my colleague Tom, who sadly isn't here, he was doing a network traffic analysis of this camera. And um, he saw that the home base was connected to the end user's home network. And he also detected that there was an internal network. A hidden network, but he didn't know the VPI key, so he came to me and he said, Victor, can you please give me the VPI key? I, of course, accepted. Um, so, how will we analyze this device? We'll use three different methods of analysis network traffic analysis, trying to see what protocol is used where, or what can we see, firmware analysis, trying to find secrets and vulnerabilities, and we also do symbolic analysis, but I'll come back to that a bit later because it's more um, difficult. So, Let's start with cracking the VPI key for Tom. So, of course, I immediately break his device. Um, I find the UART ports, use my UART DTL reader to get the firmware. Um, however, uh, the device boots, but I get booted into a login. I cannot bypass the login. Um, but luckily, I can boot into a temporary shell where I have five minutes to find uh, a password, which I do, and I can bypass the login and I have a shell but the shell is really unstable, so I immediately get the MTD blocks and get the firmware so my analysis can start and the boring part can stop. So now Tom is happy. I found the VPI key. I go to Tom and say, here's your VPI key. So normally my part would be over, but I got intrigued. Uh, I saw a lot of suspicious activity on the device, and mainly I saw the reuse of passwords. The UART password was exactly the same as the VPI2 key. And the password was not random. We had two of these devices, and we, we saw that there was a pattern, so it's not random. So we decided to dive a bit deeper into the password, and while diving in the logs, we saw that um, the password was set dynamically, which was very interesting. So we trace it back using Gitga, we find the strings in a binary, and after this, we get this beautiful function. And in this beautiful function, we see that the Serial number is MD5 hashed, then base64 encoded, and finally the last eight, the, the first eight bytes are taken. So, and then they set the password. So you think, okay, that's the vulnerability. The VPI2 key is directly linked to the serial number. How could it get any worse? Well, easily. Um, so let's uh, go a bit deeper in the generation process. They have a serial number and a VPI key. So you take the MD5 hash. And from this MD5 hash, we take a base64 string. We take the first eight bytes. That's the password. But there's something interesting. Um, base64 encoding takes three bytes and encodes it into four bytes. So it means they only use six hex characters as entropy for their password, which is less than their serial number. So there are only 16 million different combinations for their passwords. They're making their security worse. But So, how does our attack now look like? We find our home base in the wild. Note, we do not have to be attached to a LAN or anything. We just need to be in a physical proximity. We can steal the VPI key, and then we can um, get the VPI handshake, crack it offline with a brute force attack using our custom made to word list in sub-20 seconds. But it's worse. The home base, as I said, is connected to the end user's home network. So you would expect the home base to behave as a router and to isolate these two networks properly. Well, it absolutely doesn't. Um, you can just, once you're in the network, you can do everything. This is the works. This is the authentication bypass we encountered. But let's go a bit deeper. Let's go into breaking the encryption. Well, you say, um, 
breaking the encryption. You just told me it's unencrypted. Uh, yeah, but I didn't tell you the complete story. The home base is a pretty sophisticated piece of soft uh, hardware, and it can also communicate directly with a phone, can uh, communicate with clouds, over the cloud to a phone, to itself, and also as a web server, does a lot of things. So how does it encrypt? Here are the two functions we encountered. It has a peer-to-peer -peer encryption protocol, um, where it basically concatenates two strings, and that's the password. It also has a media encryption protocol, um, it also takes a serial number and a, par, a, and a base parameter, which are basically two strings. And it does some things and it has a, a key. doesn't really matter. Um, the main point is, wait, it's all unencrypted. Always has been. Um, so let's go a, a level of, of abstraction higher. We have a serial number, a base parameter, and a random number. They do some key derivation stuff and they have their key. So we want um, to know what they do with this key. They have a, an image, they encrypt the image, and it looks like this. There are three parts we can see. The first part is a UEFI header. In this header, it's purely clear text. We can see the serial number and the random value used in the encryption of the image. Then they have an encrypted JFIF header, so the JFIF header is encrypted. But the body of the JFIF is actually still unencrypted, which is really interesting. Uh, we tried to brute force the header or guess the header, but that didn't work although I still don't believe that this is secure. Um, so we did manual reverse engineering to try and find the key. However, as you all know, manual reverse engineering is complex, fault prone, and takes a long time. And because the function was so complex, I failed. Couldn't do it, sorry. Um, so we had to search for something else. We came up with selective execution. So what do I mean by this? Well, we want to just reconstruct the IS key. We want to um, execute one function. Uh, because it's an IoT binary, the binary boots, it checks the hardware, uh, does some writes and reads to flash memory, starts threads, all of these threads also write and read to memory. And we don't want to do that, we just want to execute the function create key. It's also a cross-architecture binary, it's a MIPS binary by the way. We want to run it with concrete inputs, since we know the concrete inputs from, because they're in an image already. I want to avoid the complex setup, because I'm lazy. So, you could say, just using a debugger like GDP, Radare, um, they allow for targeted execution. You can just, um, uh, or procedural debugging, you can run it a, a single function with concrete inputs really easily. However, it doesn't work on cross-architecture binaries, but there's a bypass. You actually can use a cross-compiled debugger on the device, but because we have only a very unstable UART shell, we decide not to do this, but it would also be an option. So we do not opt for a debugger. You could say do emulation. Emulation allows you to execute cross-architecture binaries, very good, but there is no selective execution. You have to boot the whole binary, run the whole binary to find the one function I want to execute. And it's also really complex to emulate these NVRAM calls and to uh, fake all the peripherals and sensors. It's pain in the ass, so we decide not to do emulation. Final option would be to just use binary lifting. Binary lifting takes your cross architecture binary and makes it architecture agnostic. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Once the binary is architecture agnostic, you're able to execute this lifted binary, but there's just like with emulation, there is no selective execution uh, possible. So binary lifting is not done. Instead, we develop our own solution. Our own solution is named Danger. It's a debugger for Anger and combines binary lifting with debugging. So we use the binary lifting included in, in uh, Anger. Anger uses VEX IR as an intermediate language. And we use a self-made debugger to debug upon this code. It basically works like a cross-architecture symbolic GDB. Um, and also very important, it simplifies the use of Anger. By the way, for those that don't know Anger, Anger is a very powerful symbolic execution engine and is often used to uh, find and detect vulnerabilities in software. And using our command line interface, we make it way easier to use because one of the pitfalls of Anger is that you still have to write your own code for each exploit. Now you don't anymore. Um, so. A quick example on how it works. You have a process message 
function doesn't matter. You want to know what it does. And you have a main function, and you can see some strings, so you have your concrete inputs, but you don't want to do the rest. Uh, imagine there's all other NVRAM calls after this. So you can just run Danger, load the example, load in some hooks, all included. You have to set a function prototype, tell uh, Anger what uh, types of um, variables it will encounter, and then you have to call the function using your concrete inputs, and then you just start it and you get the return value and you know exactly what happened to the function. Only the function is executed, all the rest is not done. Very intuitive. Anger, uh, Danger allows you to relay the start of execution to a selected address. You can set and retrieve registers or memory. You can debug over logic blocks and you can stop at breakpoints, but also at branch points. And you also have all the capabilities that are already included in base anger. So you have all the symbolic weapons to attack um, a binary. So how do we leverage Danger to replicate an IS key? So we call the encryption function, we use the serial number and the base parameter as parameters, and we hook the random number, and then we will get the AES key as a return value. So let's um, explain how it happens. We capture an encrypted image, we extract the serial number and the random number, but we also still have to capture some network traffic because we have to extract the base parameter. It's another secret parameter, UEFI leaks. And then we leverage Danger to uh, generate our AES key. However, there's one annoying point. This uh, capturing the network traffic, um, it sucks. So we do some more analysis and we find that only a small part of this base parameter is actually used. Uh, it's only used in the function you can see there and only four uh, characters are used and they're um, ported to an integer and just summed. Uh, there's even a check if it's um, smaller than five, then it doesn't work. So it has an entropy of 35. So it's easily brute forcible. So our normal workflow is like this. We capture an encrypted image. We extract the serial number and the random number. We brute force the base parameter. And then we use anger to generate a key. And then we have a key. To make sure this key is correct, um, we have to make sure the, the base parameter is correct. We decrypt an image and we check for the magic bytes. If there are magic bytes of a uh, JFIF, we know the image has been decrypted successfully. Um, note that we do not know, ha, need any device-specific knowledge. So if we would find a cloud server of UEFI in the wild with all uh, different encrypted images, we can just decrypt all of them very easily. Um, this vulnerability was disclosed to UEFI in June 2023. It was, uh, they gave us a disclosure period of 12 months, which was very long. It was patched um, last month, I believe. Um, and we've also uh, received a CVE number. Note that it's still reserved, but it will get a 9.3 rating. And you can see here the, also the notes of UEFI in their app that they're finally uh, updating and implementing the countermeasures. We had a, uh, a long conversation with them on how um, they should do it. So some insights we gained during our research. We saw that UEFI likes do-it-yourself solutions, which are really common in the IoT world. But it's sad because they actually try to be compliant to standards. They try to implement security. They try to implement unique passwords. But by trying this, they fail horribly and they introduce huge weaknesses. We also had the security versus usability discussion because we see a serial number linked to a password as a vulnerability, but they see it as a feature because their doorbell just has to know the serial number of the home base and can connect to its network. Very intuitive, right? Um, so what do we think the solution should be? We think there should, should be industry standard vetted protocols, reference architectures, and proof of concepts. What do we mean by this? We shouldn't tell them implement unique passwords. We also should tell them how to do it. We should give them examples you can use this architecture, this type of um, method, this software works. Here's an example of what should you watch out for. Don't link it to your serial number, things like that. Because developers try themselves and they always fail. Um, so what can we conclude? I think we can conclude that we undermine security of the complete ecosystem by combining distinct attack factors. We looked at the device from a network perspective, from a, a firmware perspective, perspective, and we also did symbolic execution. And combining all our different attack factors, 
we had one big, very successful attack. We also introduced Danger in this research, which uh, is a debugger for Anger, and it simplifies manual reverse engineering and is a really powerful tool. Um, last week, my colleague um, solved five different capture the flag challenges using Danger. Um, so it's actually something really useful. So thank you for your attention. Um, I encourage you all to read the paper. There's a lot more information in it. And you can also use uh, Denger yourself. It's completely open source and useful. Um, and I think tonight we'll be doing a demo also on Denger. Um, so that's it. Thank you.